Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. We will start uh, with our af first afternoon panel. I think we are not, the audience is not complete, but the, uh, the, the panelists are here. So we decided we have to start. We are already in, in delay, so we will just go and I'm sure one or the other will come. So I am very honored that I can introduce, um, oh, first of all, welcome all of you to this uh, panel on minorities, authoritarianism and fascism transnational attraction conflicts and dilemmas. You can see it's a complex title that we want to cover here. Um, and I'm honored to be able to, to moderate and, uh, and introduce these uh, three outstanding historians um, next to me. We will start in the order of the program with uh, Emmanuel Dale uh, Mulder. I don't think I I don't think I have to introduce anyone here. Um, all of them outstanding historians of nationalism and fascism. Then we will continue with uh, Andrea Di Michele, and then um, we will end this first round of presentations with uh, Jose Nunez. And just without further ado, I think we can. Start right away. Don't forget your limit of 15 minutes, please. All right. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you, everybody, for being here and listening to me today. As you can see from the slides, I'm going to talk about um, the um, Flemish German Dutch transnational space and how minority and nationality questions played out. In the interwar years, mostly, I'll talk a little bit about the period before, but it, essentially I'll focus, and also about the period after, but I'll essentially focus on the late 1930s and a little bit the early 1940s. Now, um, uh, I'm going to first uh, explain why this paper uh, and why, why a paper on minorities and, fa and fascism and why in, uh, in this panel. Uh, I'll also... Uh, <coughs> talk about uh, Flanders and what I call heterogeneity questions in interwar Europe and I try to use this term to couple together minority and nationality questions. Um, and then I'll focus on uh, a political party that was created in Flanders in the 1930s, that is the Flemish Nationalist Union, and um, two people within this party that were very important, uh, Gustav de Klerk and Raymond Tolenaer. And I'll explain why they are important, why they have to do with transnational contacts between uh, German nationalists and Flemish nationalists, and um, also the uh, radicalization of Flemish nationalism towards the extreme right and new order ideas. And essentially, I'll explain how these two people somehow uh, worked to um, bring, uh, basically, to create an alliance with uh, the Nazi regime to try to uh, obtain their the goals of um, uh, self-determination for Flanders, or rather reunification within the greater, greater Netherlandic people, as they defined it at the time, and how these uh, also converted itself, uh, of course, against their will, into a threat to the Flemings as a people, conceived as a people. And through this um, process, I'll explain also how the idea, the conception of Flanders and the Flemish people went through different stages throughout the interwar period from being conceived by most Flemish nationalists as a nation endowed with the right to self-determination, at least in terms of autonomy or in terms of equality with the Francophones within Belgium, to uh, other understandings, some against the will of Flemish nationalists. Um, so that's more or less the plan. Um, so. Why this paper and why in a panel on fascism and minorities? Um, basically, this is part of a broader research project in which I would like to draw the attention of the current historiography of minority questions on uh, Western European cases. And, uh, of course, proposing Flanders and the Flemish question as a minority question uh, draws a lot of criticism because the Flemings were a demographic major majority in Belgium. However, as I'll try to show, Many, many, a few authors in, in Flanders describe them as a, a sociological minority, 
uh, Flemish nationalism in the interwar period was actually striving to achieve many uh, uh, many policies that other groups in other parts of Europe were uh, trying to achieve under the label, label of minority rights. So even if even Flemish nationalists were a little bit worried of using the word minority, many realized they were asking very similar things like uh, linguistic rights, equality with French, between Flemish and French, protection from the Flemish language, autonomy for Flanders, some independence as well. Um, why in a panel on fascism? Because, as I will show, during the nine, late, from the late 1920s to the, throughout the 1930s, there is a process of radicalization within Flemish nationalism, whereby, especially under the uh, umbrella of this party, the uh, Flemish Nationalist Union, there is a, um, a new generation of, uh, of uh, young nationalists that bring about, uh, they basically introduce into Flemish nationalists strong uh, extreme right idea, new order ideas, and they couple it with another conception of Flanders that existed before, but only in cultural terms, not never in a politicized way, and only on the margins of the Flemish political spectrum, or even the cultural spectrum, which was the understanding of Flanders as part of a greater Netherlandic nation that included the Netherlands and also a part of northern, most northwestern France. So I, I, I believe that, you know, for this reason, it, it, it fits somehow the theme of, of the panel. Now, um, in terms of the literature, um, there is a lot of literature on uh, collaboration between Flemish nationalists and the Nazi regime or German nationalists. However, and this is a, a genuinely transnational um, a literature, a historiography, but the concerns of these historians are domestic. So they look at transnational contacts, at transnational processes, at tra sources across the border, but mostly to explain why people collaborated, how, whether the collaboration somehow helped Germans invade Belgium, and so on, who, who, are, respons who are the res main responsible for collaboration, and so on and so forth. I would like to use the Flemish case to, 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 to um, somehow contribute to a broader international and transnational literature, which is the, the historiography of the minority question in Europe as a whole. And I think that the Flemish question embodies the, um, uh, the perfectly the ambiguity of the time. So, the, the, um, in order to, to explain that, I have to introduce a little bit uh, what I mean by minority and nationality questions and what's the, the transition that occurred around the end of the First World War. So, of course, there are people that have already raised this problem to some extent. Chose is one of them. Um, but there is a tendency in the historiography, still lingering on, that uh, basically portrays nationality questions as something of the pre-First World period, and then minority questions as something that came after. Nationality questions are something that is typical of imperial settings, because in imperial settings we don't have equality between the different units. Minority questions are something that is typical of nation states, where there is equality and you can establish a majority and a minority, especially in electoral terms. Now, this is broadly speaking true. There is a minority protection system that is created in 1919. There is a transition in discourse, but the, the two terms keep coexisting throughout the, 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 the interwar period. Probably the best embodiment of this coexistence and ambiguity is the Congress of European Nationalities, or nationalities, that however was defending minority rights. So it was a international organization, sorry, a kind of NGO created by represent minority representatives, nationality representatives to defend minority rights, but under using the, the word nationality in the name of the organization and often also in their discussion. Here you have a Google engram, some of the two terms, or uh, rather uh, the, the terms minority nationality questions, and you can see that certainly there is a spike in the use of minority question. But the term nationality question that doesn't really disappear. Now, the two basically refer to the same underlying problem, which is the problem of heterogeneity in a, in a Europe, the interwar Europe, that basically sees the nation state as embodied, enshrined as the, the normal unit of political uh, uh, organization. And therefore, in this uh, equation between state and nation, minorities don't really fit. Now, um, as I said, I think Flanders uh, embodies perfectly the ambiguity between the two terms, the overlaps, 
and this um, uh, not completed transition between the two terms simply because what is Flanders? And if you ask this question and you look at different actors and how they, they, they answer, you can see that the term is not that clear, whether they are a minority, a majority, a nationality, a nation, a region, a people, part of a, grid, bring, a, a broader people, part of a broader Russia group, depending on the actors that you uh, actually uh, study, examine, and also the historical period, the, uh, the, the, the answers are very different. Broadly speaking, to give some uh, ideas about how um, uh, the, 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 the question has been answered, within the broader nationalist, uh, Flemish nationalist movement, especially the moderate one, there, is a, there was a lot of reluctance to use the term minority, but many pointed to uh, a lot of similarities between the Flemish question and other minority questions, or groups that were in a minority situation within a broader nation state or a broader state. For instance, there are continuous references to Ireland, and, uh, and Flanders is many times basically compared to Ireland as a, a, a group that is somehow discriminated against, or it is uh, subjected uh, to a condition of subordination uh, within the state where they live. Uh, the, the use of the term minority actually happens sometimes. Uh, there is a scholar, Josef van Overbeke, who wrote a text later, in the, in, at the beginning of the 19, uh, uh, at the, between the end of the 1930s and the beginning of the 1940s, about minority rights. He doesn't mention Flanders, but he defines minorities as um, the, the, the term minority as something that doesn't depend on size. And then I found in the archives the um, documents from the Belgian Foreign Affairs that were following his activities because he was very active at the international level, and they were complaining that he was uh, actually defending the generalization of minority rights to include the Flemish, and uh, you know, it was quoted Flemish minority. So this uh, discourse, uh, this term was also used sometimes, not not a lot, but sometimes. There is also another actor that was not using the word minority, but was defining the Flemish people in ways that are similar to minorities, and it was the pan-German uh, pan movement from uh, the, at least the end of the 19th century, even before, until uh, before the First World War, and then again in the 1930s. So you see already this kind of instability in the meaning of the term, depending on whom you ask, and also the perspective you take. Now, in the late 1920s, there is begins a process of radicalization whereby many young, Flan many young students, especially in Flanders, become attracted to radical right ideas, new order ideas, not something that happens also in other countries. And uh, they basically contribute to the formation of a new party, the Flemish Nationalist Union, that is led by the man you see on the left, right, left, bottom left corner, Gustave de Klerk. And probably the embodiment of this generation is the other man in the, in the, in the slide, Raymond Tolenaere. So these two men would drive a process of the radicalization and would be also at the forefront of contact with the Nazis to try to realize the goals of, the, of, the, of, of this party. Now this party innovates, first because it brings new order idea into Flemish nationalism, but also because they defend, they take this idea of a greater Netherlandic nation, greater Netherlandic people, that was, as I said, existed in, cultural, in the cultural sphere and was in the, in the margins also of the cultural sphere. They take it and they bring it in, they put it in the middle of, in the, at the core of the propaganda of this party. So this is a new understanding of Flanders, not anymore a nationality that is in itself, um, you know, uh, endowed with the right to self-determination or autonomy, but as part of a broader uh, group. Um, and they identify Nazi uh, Germany as the ally to bring about this goal, which in the 1930s is seen as something very difficult to realize. So uh, Gustav de Klerk, uh, Raymond Lenore is the ideologue. He brought these ideas into the party, uh, this, in party discourse and, and, and program. De Klerk was more of a pragmatic uh, figure and he built a secret diplomacy with the Nazi regime from 1937 more or less until the, the invasion in 1940. He also created a military organization ready to help the Nazis during the invasion. It didn't really make a difference, first because the Germans didn't really need a lot of help to invade Belgium, and second because it was also, most people were uh, arrested by the Belgian authorities that were following closely. But basically all this to say that they drive this transition, and by the beginning of, like, uh, during the summer of 1940, they feel quite confident to say the moment of the greater Netherlandic nation has come. Uh, they, they, you can see that in many texts, in many exchanges, 
in the mid-1930s, it was still about, well, we don't know, we have to lay down the ground for this to happen maybe in 50 years. But in 1940, with the help of the Germans, they say, we can do it. But then they realized very soon that not everybody agreed the Germans in the first place. When I say the Germans, I mean, of course, the German government as the authorities, not the Germans as a whole, because that's a different story. Now, so within the period from 1940 to 1944, there is a whole period in which the Nazi government is keeping the question of Flanders very open, not saying what would be the future. The VNV, so this party, the Klerk and Tolenaere, until their death, because they die both around 41 and 42, they try to push the Germans to commit to some kind of, uh, you know, of guarantee for uh, Flanders. They won't, they, they didn't, they didn't uh, achieve it. They started also doing some very strong acrobatic uh, formulations of what Flanders was to try to accommodate ger the German authorities. So starting saying that, yes, we are an independent nation, we are part of the greater Netherlands people, but we are also German brothers. We are a Germanic race, a Germanic nation, try to accommodate to see whether this somehow would allow them to uh, get something from the regime. And one important quote in 1943, after the clerk died, new leader, following more or less the same line, in, in one internal document, he was complaining about the Nazi policy towards Flanders, and he said the result of a, the, the, basically the, this policy and the creation of some organizations that were pushing for pan-German pan ideas, so transformation of Flanders as a, in, as, as a province within the broader Reich, they uh, basically, he basically wrote to, to the German authorities that the creation of this organization, this pan-German organization, was the result of a, sorry, 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 the result, I'm almost done, almost done. <laughs> Was the result was the um, the result of a deliberate German policy to create a movement to express its striving in the slogan "I'm seen Reich." And the use of this word "I'm seen Reich" is clearly was "I'm seen Reich" probably is clearly uh, a clear reference to a policy that the German government was pursuing in Central and Eastern Europe toward German minorities and and, and that were supposed to be reintegrated either through uh, basically mostly through population transfer into the, 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 the territory of the Reich. So you see here the, uh, con the conception of Flanders that has gone full circle from uh, an independent nation, an independent people endowed with rights of autonomy, linguistic protection, self-determination, to this pan Netherlandic idea to again, against the will of Flemish nationalists and through the collaboration with this ally that turned to be actually not an ally in, in the end, but somebody who would turn them into a German minority to be incorporated. And that's what was also happened in, in practice because in July 44, Flanders was incorporated as a province in the German Reich directly, although only for a few months, because then the liberation basically brought it back to be part of Belgium. So to conclude, uh, I think this uh, case shows three things. First, minority, majority, nationality are relative and situational categories. It depends a lot on who is using them and in what context. And as a consequence also of this, the transition from nationality question to minority question in the interwar period, and then of course in the early 40s as well, is as, least, as less clear-cut than it is often suggested. And finally, I think it also challenges the idea of a kin state. So this idea that is a lot, used a lot in nationalism studies about you know, minorities that have a majority somewhere else. Well, the most obvious, let's say, if you can use obvious kin state here, would be the Netherlands. And the, Net the Dutch government was never, ever interested in supporting Flemish radical nationalism, ever. But the, the Nazi government, or the German government in general, was much more interested. But the collaboration and this kind of kin state support turned out being actually a great disadvantage uh, and even a threat uh, for uh, the, the, the existence, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the persistence of the uh, Flemish nation as an autonomous entity. And that's it. Thank you very much. And we will pass to the next speaker, Andrea.
io, ah, ecco scusate, quello di cui vorrei parlare io è la questione eh, del trattamento delle minoranze linguistiche nazionali in Italia durante il fascismo, quindi dopo l'annessione eh, di determinati territori alla fine della prima guerra mondiale. E, e ovviamente non racconterò in che cosa ha consistito questa politica di italianizzazione di, queste, eh, di questi territori, ma mi, eh, mi concentrerò eh, su una questione, eh, eh, una tesi, diciamo così, che vorrei sottolineare, e cioè la forte continuità tra il nazionalismo prebellico, le idee, le persone, gli slogan del nazionalismo prebellico e la politica che il fascismo conduce nel corso degli anni venti. Quando parlo di continuità di questo nazionalismo, la cosa particolare è che mi riferisco in particolare al nazionalismo italiano che nasce e si sviluppa nell'Austria-Ungheria cioè che nasce e si sviluppa in queste terre di confine dell'impero austro-ungarico che poi verranno annesse al Regno d'Italia alla fine della Prima Guerra Mondiale. Ecco, io ho, volevo se semplicemente mostrarvi alcune cartine, giusto perché non è detto che tutti abbiano eh, diciamo, in mente in maniera chiara di quali territori stiamo parlando. Qui vedete la, la, quali sono i territori che vengono annessi dall'Italia eh, dopo la Prima Guerra Mondiale, sono esattamente questi il cosiddetto Trentino Alto Adige e poi la Venezia Giulia con il territorio istriano. Quello di cui parlerò ora è il territorio appunto al confine con eh, l'Austria nata dalle ceneri dell'impero austro-ungarico e quindi parliamo appunto di questo territorio qua, il Trentino e l'Alto Adige che facevano parte della contea austriaca del Tirolo e, e, e che si caratterizzavano per una diciamo, compresenza di popolazione di lingua italiana e di lingua tedesca, il che non era assolutamente una particolarità all'interno dell'impero austro-ungarico, ciò che era abbastanza particolare e insolito per questo territorio era che la popolazione di lingua italiana e quella di lingua tedesca vivevano nel Tirolo ma erano geograficamente piuttosto separati, no? cioè non erano mescolati come altre realtà, come ad esempio quella della Venezia Giulia, e dell'Istria, della Dalmazia, ma vivevano tendenzialmente la, 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 la parte italiana nel Trentino, quindi nella parte meridionale di questo territorio, e la parte di lingua tedesca nel eh, Sud Tirolo o Alto Adige. Ecco che qua vediamo ovviamente eh, di che cosa stiamo parlando nel momento in cui esiste ancora l'impero eh, austro-ungarico. Ecco, questo è il Tirolo, così come viene diviso alla fine della prima guerra mondiale e la parte appunto che va a sud di questa linea di confine eh, della linea del Brennero è la parte che diventa eh, italiana con questo alto adige abitato da una maggioranza in larghissima maggioranza di, eh, da una popolazione in larghissima maggioranza di lingua tedesca allora la tesi, la mia tesi diciamo è appunto quella di questa forte, fortissima continuità e, e, e vorrei mh, presentarla un po' su due punti. Il primo è sottolineando come eh, il discorso nazionalista, lo scontro nazionale che si determina a partire dalla seconda metà dell'Ottocento anche in questa regione, così come in tutte le regioni dell'impero, vede protagonisti nazionalisti di lingua italiana e nazionalisti di lingua tedesca che sostanzialmente usano gli stessi temi, usano gli stessi argomenti, usano gli stessi discorsi, le stesse immagini. Questo è il primo elemento, il primo punto. Il secondo elemento è il ruolo fondamentale che questo nazionalismo, nato e cresciuto in questa terra di confine sotto l'Austria, svolge poi nel determinare, nel disegnare, nel, nell'immaginare e nel concretizzare le politiche di italianizzazione del fascismo nelle aree di confine. Ecco, il primo punto, la similitudine, no? la specularità dei temi dei due nazionalismi eh, contrastanti. E, mh, noi sappiamo che un po' in tutto l'impero si sviluppa una forte contrapposizione tra le diverse comunità linguistiche, che questa contrapposizione è portata avanti in maggioranza da una minoranza diciamo, di attivisti eh, borghesi si muove su diversi piani, in particolare sul piano eh, linguistico, eh, attraverso l'associazionismo culturale, attraverso riviste e in particolare attraverso la creazione e la nascita di scuole, di scuole in determinate eh, eh, lingue di insegnamento. 
In tutti i due i casi, quello tedesco e quello italiano, quindi tra 8 e 900, al centro del discorso e, e nazionalista vi è eh, la dimensione storica. Sostanzialmente eh, la ricostruzione storica, il racconto storico eh, della storia del territorio è centrale per entrambi i nazionalisti nel motivare il proprio diritto appunto, storico originario al controllo del territorio conteso e quindi noi abbiamo anche in Tirolo a partire dalla seconda metà dell'Ottocento una vasta schiera di filologi, archeologi, medievisti, antichisti ma anche antropologi eccetera che si confrontano appunto su questa dimensione eh, storica e ehm, i protagonisti furono sia personalità e istituzioni legate al territorio tirolese ma trattandosi di determinare in questo caso il confine tra due grandi diciamo così, eh, famiglie storico-culturali europee come quella germanica e quella italiana, noi abbiamo un attivismo eh, da parte anche di attori importanti che si muovono a livello, ai livelli nazionali. Quindi al centro di questa contrapposizione vi è la questione delle origini storico-culturali del territorio, vi è la questione di chi possa rivendicare i maggiori diritti sul territorio alla luce di un più precoce e solido radicamento. E quindi strettamente collegato a questo vi è il discorso sulle origini e il carattere etnico più profondo delle popolazioni che abitano il territorio. E i nazionalisti di lingua tedesca incentrano la loro attenzione soprattutto sul Trentino, cioè sulla parte meridionale che è abitata da popolazioni di lingua italiana, sostenendo che questa popolazione fosse da considerarsi tedesca, nonostante la lingua che parlasse, nonostante la lingua fosse italiana, ecco la radice storico-culturale di questa popolazione si sostiene è eh, tedesca perché tedesche sarebbero state le popolazioni originarie dalle quali queste attuali derivavano. Quindi rafforzare la posizione della lingua tedesca ad esempio attraverso la creazione di scuole in lingua tedesca non era una forma di violenza, diciamo così, ma era una forma di mh, tentativo di ristabilire quella che era la realtà eh, dei fatti. E, e da parte tedesca in particolare eh, ci si eh, concentra sul periodo storico medievale, si sottolinea l'importanza di questa fase storica, e, mh, sostenendo che le, le origini della popolazione di lingua tedesca e anche italiana a sud del Brennero risalissero appunto alle antiche stirpi germaniche che avevano valicato eh, le, le, le Alpi più di mille anni prima. Ecco, da parte italiana troviamo un discorso assolutamente eh, simile, spostando molto all'indietro l'interesse storico, spostandolo ovviamente all'età romana e quindi la eh, conquista, anche se superficiale, romana di duemila anni prima sarebbe stata fondamentale nel determinare i caratteri basilari del territorio e anche della popolazione che eh, lo abitava. E, e, ed è interessante, qui ehm, si parla appunto mh, di un, come dire, un marchio indelebile posto dalla latinità, dall'antica eh, romanità, che, avrebbe, che si sarebbe impresso su tutte le popolazioni eh, presenti e future, diciamo così, di questo eh, territorio, tanto che le successive, eh, i successivi passaggi di popolazioni di lingue tedesche vengono definite infiltrazioni, sedimenti, qualcosa di comunque superficiale, che non sarebbe stato incapace di intaccare il cuore vero della popolazione. Ecco, Va sottolineato, e anche questo è un aspetto importante che ci parla di continuità, va eh, sottolineato come già a partire dalla fine dell'Ottocento non manchino, sia da parte italiana che da parte tedesca, argomentazioni di tipo, potremmo definirle, biologista razziale. E cioè ehm, quelle argomentazioni che, però, che poi vedremo riproporsi con maggior radicalità tra anni 20 ed anni 40. E mh, accenno per questione di tempo solo rapidamente a una sfida piuttosto curiosa che eh, si gioca 
mh, alla fine dell'Ottocento tra antropologi italiani e antropologi tedeschi sulle misurazioni dei crani, delle teste di questi abitanti e c'è appunto chi sostiene che il cranio brachicefalo o il, il, il cranio dodico, dodicocefalo, adesso non ricordo esattamente le denominazioni, e è preponderante nella popolazione e quindi richiamerebbe un'appartenenza etnica rispettivamente latina o invece eh, germanica. Ecco, questi sono dei discorsi che noi ritroviamo già alla fine dell'Ottocento. E ehm, questo, mh, un altro tema che rende molto vicini e molto simili le argomentazioni di questi nazionalismi è il tema della terra, della proprietà terriera, del radicamento sulla terra. Cioè e, e, entrambi i discorsi per entrambi i nazionalismi, per potersi dire davvero padroni di un determinato territorio, bisogna possederne eh, il suolo. E, e, e questo tema è un tema che diventa particolarmente importante durante la guerra mondiale, la prima guerra mondiale ovviamente, e dopo la prima guerra mondiale. Noi sappiamo che già durante la prima guerra mondiale vi sono dei piani da parte austriaca, soprattutto da parte dei vertici dell'esercito austriaco di requisizione di terre eh, appartenenti a Trentini, quindi di lingua italiana, che erano eh, diciamo, passati dall'altra parte ed avevano deciso di combattere con l'esercito italiano, i cosiddetti irredentisti, coloro che si arruolano nell'esercito italiano e combattono contro l'Austria, che formalmente era il loro paese, no? quindi dei traditori. Ecco, a questi vengono requisite le terre e si immagina su, eh, questi, su queste terre di impiantare dei coloni di lingua eh, tedesca. Ecco, sono questi dei progetti che si immaginano durante la guerra e che sono molto simili a quei progetti in parte realizzati del fascismo in Alto Adige negli anni venti. Ecco, quindi c'è una grossa continuità e anche un grosso scambio, tra virgolette, di idee tra questi diversi eh, nazionalismi. Ecco, il secondo elemento che volevo sottolineare è quello di questa centralità di questo nazionalismo che nasce e si sviluppa nelle lotte nazionali austro-ungariche, diciamo così, dell'impero, questa forte centralità nel segnare le politiche del fascismo in queste aree di confine. E, mh, vi è, come dire, mh, i temi, le argomentazioni, ma anche le persone che applicano poi, che mettono in campo, in atto queste, queste politiche, ecco, transitano in alcuni casi in maniera significativa da un passato austro-ungarico a, pas a un presente italiano sotto eh, il fascismo. Ovviamente i temi sono quello della storia, non serve che lo ripeta, la questione della romanità ovviamente in una zona di confine come questa è mh, assolutamente centrale, è un tema presente in tutta Italia ovviamente centrale nella propaganda del fascismo ma in questo territorio in maniera eh, particolare e il fascismo riprende anche, anche se con molte contraddizioni e con molte oscillazioni, riprende questa visione secondo cui la popolazione locale, anche se parlante tedesco, di fatto è originariamente latina. E cioè si sostiene che questa sia una popolazione, come dire, mh, eh, non un corpo estraneo alla nazione che si debba eliminare e che si debba magari mandare via, ma che sia piuttosto una italianità perduta, diciamo così, che bisogna recuperare. Ecco, al centro di questa popolazione, nonostante la lingua che parli, vi è una radice mh, romana, latina, che è data appunto da questa latinizzazione, romanizzazione di duemila anni prima. Ecco, questo discorso ci porterebbe ad affrontare poi la questione della categoria del razzismo, che in molti casi viene utilizzata, secondo me, con eccessiva facilità, no? cioè si sostiene il fascismo eh, eh, ha una visione razzista delle popolazioni di altra lingua. Ecco, io non credo che si possa utilizzare la categoria del razzismo se per razzismo intendiamo l'idea che vi sia, come dire, una, una radicale diversità che in maniera inevitabile si trasmette da una generazione all'altra, ecco questa diversità radicale inassimilabile non c'è da parte del fascismo, a tutt'altro, questi tedeschi sono al loro 
cuore italiani e possono diventare italiani, anzi devono diventare italiani. Ah, tu. E le persone, dicevano, questa continuità delle persone, ad esempio il, il teorico dell'italianizzazione dell'Alto Adige, ma non soltanto il teorico, anche colui che redige eh, la lista delle cose da fare per italianizzare l'Alto Adige, che verrà poi approvata dal fascismo, è un certo, un certo Ettore Tolomei che era un trentino, cioè era un suddito austriaco, era un suddito austriaco che a partire dall'inizio del Novecento aveva incentrato la sua attività politica e culturale sulla questione dell'Alto Adige e che non a caso viene recuperato, diciamo così, viene ripreso dal eh, fascismo come eh, mh, una persona appunto utile perché in grado di gestire l'italianizzazione. Eh, ecco, sono sempre i nazionalisti, sono sempre le stesse persone che impostano i primi piani di conquista del suolo, no? cioè di acquisizione di beni terrieri e di contadini di lingua tedesca e, e per poterli assegnare a dei contadini che arrivano dal resto d'Italia. Quindi per concludere, per capire la visione e la pratica del fascismo verso le minoranze, a mio avviso, è fondamentale studiare forse meglio e di più di quanto non sia stato fatto il nazionalismo prebellico, sia quello nato ovviamente nel regno in Italia, ma secondo me in maniera particolare quello nato in Austria, nato in Austria-Ungheria. E ehm, si è parlato infatti di eredità austriaca no? per, i territori, per i territori che sono passati da questa Austria-Ungheria ai diversi stati successori. Ecco, il tema della contrapposizione nazionale è una di queste eredità austriaca austriache e infatti da un certo punto di vista l'Italia si può quasi considerare uno stato successore dell'impero austro-ungarico perché alla fine della guerra inglobando questi territori ingloba anche un tema assolutamente centrale come quello della contrapposizione tra gruppi linguistici differenti che è una novità per la storia d'Italia, è davvero una svolta in particol particolarmente ehm, importante. Se poi vogliamo esaminare quello che fu il comportamento delle minoranze di fronte al fascismo e quindi di, di questa popolazione di lingua tedesca, noi sappiamo che eh, anche queste minoranze restano fortemente legate alla tradizione nazionalista, sono gli stessi attivisti eh, di prima che continuano in molti casi espatriando, andando in Austria, ad essere gli attivisti antifascisti, anti-italiani del dopo e molti di questi attivisti nazionalisti in molti casi verranno poi coinvolti nelle politiche che eh, porterà avanti eh, il, il regime nazionalsocialista quando tra il 43 e il 45 questo territorio verrà completamente occupato eh, dai tedeschi, non formalmente annesso ma di fatto annesso. Quindi in entrambi i casi, da parte italiana e da parte tedesca, direi che più che alla rottura determinata dal fascismo, credo si debba ragionare e studiare sulla continuità rappresentata dal nazionalismo, anzi dai nazionalismi. Grazie. Okay, thank you very much. I will try to be uh, as brief as possible, but those who know me know that I tend to extend myself too long, so please be, uh, uh, be go straight and, and simply retire me the microphone if necessary. Well, uh, actually, I have to apologize because I think I gave something like uh, uh, one title, a different title, and then I sent to our chairman or chairwoman uh, a different paper uh, dealing with the views of the original question by early Spanish fascists before July 1936. And then I uh, realized that perhaps it would be a little bit more interesting to resurrect an old project which I have developed together with Professor Mike Numba, who are now at the University of Nottingham, which was a comparison of fascist regionalism uh, between uh, Nazi Germany and Franco Spain. 
And I will, my point is to try to uh, look at the question of the relationship or the issue of the relationship between regionalism or diverse forms of subnational identity and fascism, just from the other side. I mean, how fascists tried, or fascist regimes try to hijack uh, regional sentiments or try to use subnational units for their own purposes. Obviously, in the two preceding papers, we have seen how uh, active nationalist activists or ethno-nationalist activists have tried to or uh, fail the attraction of fascism, uh, or how a fascist regime uh, with a notorious and noteworthy continuity with the pre-First World War practices tried to assimilate with different arguments and border minority. However, uh, I think that we, uh, we miss a part of the picture we don't consider how fascism or different types of fascist regimes dealt with different regional and local uh, identities within their own nations and try to use localism or try to use cultural regionalism or regionalized state nationalism that if for their own purposes and in fact Localism and cultural regionalism, I mean, not all forms of national claims, even claims for self-government, are invested with self-determination or with a claim for national self-determination and can be considered to be political regionalism, cultural regionalism, localism, even regionalized state nationalism. I mean, and the, uh, different forms of these claims were promoted to various degrees with regimes of Hitler, Mussolini, Petain, and Franco, because, in my view, it suited their ideological agendas. And despite, in spite of the many differences in the value placed on the region in all four countries, and more, this strategy went beyond sheer opportunism. First of all, because elites, at least in Germany and Spain, share a deep suspicion of liberal centralization and bureaucratization the right, and even the radical right, was in favor of some kind of regionalist decentralization, of regional decentralization. Just remember, remember Charles Maurras, Spanish traditionalism, etc. Because the state was artificial. The state was a Napoleonic creation, a liberal creation. Uh, in the long run, it was a French uh, influence. And against this, regional diversity was seen as the legacy of the authentic nation, as a nation which was rooted in the Middle Ages and even earlier, and uh, was obviously pre-liberal. And regionalism also offered a form of blood and soil, blood and body politics, that remained wedded to a realist sense of the political. Because as the locus of the newly defined uh, Volksgemeinschaft, national community, regionalism, or at least the use of regional markers, help to give a sense of historical continuity to the key concepts of fascist identity, which sometimes seem to be very bad for everyday people. And fascist regimes also distrusted political romanticism, and the recourse to the region and the locality allowed them to base their quest for spatially fixed identities on territorial divisions that were already defined as political constructs. And this also allowed for a conciliation of the ultra-conservative aspect of fascist ideology with its, its quest for modernization. And this led fascist regimes to embark on massive projects within landscapes and field environments. I mean, the region was not only the realm of tradition, of agriculture, of the peasantry, even the field environment, industry, etc., was also seen as a part of this regional landscape. Well, we can address very briefly uh, four aspects of fascist regionalism, uh, the implementation of regional and local administrations, or map in the nation, the role of regional histories, the relevance of regional heritage, and the role of languages and cultures. Well, uh, as authoritarian nation states hijack at Heimat, Petit Patrie, sentiments for their own purposes, these were emptied of all political content. Representations of place tended towards the generic. And revivalist practices were projected onto an external imperial dimension. Thus, the 
role of Heimat in fascist constructions of nationhood did not necessarily challenge the notion of a centralized regime. However, uh, a most revealing test case was the role of this intermediate sphere between the local and national identity, and much depended, much depended on how a region was defined and was, what was the previous history. Uh, German lender, for instance, in the case of the German lender, we see that on the one hand, Hitler uh, associated his empire with the revival of the Prussian Empire, of the German imperial tradition, but on the, on the other hand, he had to take into account Bavarian sentiments of hatred of all things Prussian. So he tended to be pragmatic. I mean, Hitler hated Bavarian separatists, but on the other hand, many of his followers, uh, his SA members, defined themselves first as Bavarian and then as Germans. So uh, he promised from the early 1933 uh, on that, I mean, uh, the mask of what he called the mask of German federalism should be removed and Germany should uh, return to its authentic and national traditions, but taking into account the real building blocks of the German nations, which were the traditional lender. At the same time, he created the Galway. He reinforced the uh, Galway, these new part districts, uh, with, uh, a, 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 and they had, they were these party regional leaders, the Galway, and promoted competition among them. And if you see the Spanish case, we see that on the one hand, the Spanish forces fear, were afraid of separatism. Although before July 1936, they also maintained some tolerant views towards decentralization or local autonomy. I mean, this idea of the healthy countryside or the healthy province rebelling against a corrupt city, the red city, particularly in Madrid. So, and this uncertainty endures, this contradiction endure until mid-1937 and even beyond. I mean, we remember that the first uh, fascist groups in Castile even advocated local autonomy and the idea that the redemption of the provinces, which came from Ortega y Gasset, or we also, the idea of the nation in Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera was, was not referred to uh, blue to soil and blood, it was referred to destiny, the common destiny of in many territories and individuals. Uh, Italian fascists were far more pragmatic, and we know that they dealt in, uh, there was a contradiction, there was a, a big difference in the way they treated uh, border minorities, particularly as Slavs and Germans, and how they deal with uh, regional identities, particularly the, wherever they were strong. I mean, uh, the, the fascist politics in Sardinia, for instance, uh, were different in many respects because, I mean, they even came to terms with the Sardinian uh, uh, Action Party and created a new hybrid uh, outcome, which was Sardo fascism as an instrument to promote a kind of imperialist Mediterranean policy. Uh, so in the end, what we see is uh, that solutions were very different in each country. Uh, in Spain, uh, the great mistrust, the great distrust against any form of regional home rule, although devoid of political contents, and in the end determined that, uh, that the province became the cornerstone of the new administrative division and the civic governors were the local heads of the state and the party. And just in the 1940s and 1950s, new uh, nuances were added to this picture. I mean, I have no time to deal extensively about this, uh, but we also see that in the case of the dealing with regional past, uh, the fascist obsession with the past has been regarded by many authors as a kind of window dressing, it was not the main concern of uh, fascist uh, theorists. However, fascist regimes often made use of the past to stress the specific contributions of regions to the historical development of the nation. That's my view. So, for instance, the Nazis invoked paradigms such as inherited historical characteristics to give specific shape to their policies. And they used two models. First, the promotion of Volksgeschichte, 
national people's history. I mean, a discipline which used structuralist and statistical methods to write a people's history from below. And this contributed in a decisive way to the formulation of native racial policy because research into the superiority, the supposed superiority of the Germanic race most openly served the Nazis' foreign political agenda. However, the Germanic, even the Aryan race, was not treated as a homogeneous entity. I mean, Volksgeschichtler, the historians distinguished between the West, the Northeast, the Southeast, and the tribe of Germany, uh, and the Neo Germany of tribes, of Stemme, was extremely powerful. And it usually identifies several Stemme and several subgroups or Schläger. And the second major strand of Nazi regional history uh, related with the history of the Holy Roman Empire of the Middle Ages, which was celebrated as a decentralized structure, something that uniquely sweet to the varied regions of the German nations. And such connections associate a broad historical culture. I mean, uh, it has to be said that even regionalists or regional historians in Germany often uh, uh, were found among the most uh, prolific writers and the most prolific uh, contributors to the new, a new discipline, the Ostforschung, the re research into the East, such as Hermann Aubing, for instance. Well, most of my images deal with Spain, and this is the way many Valencian women received or welcomed the Frankish troops in Valencia in April 1939. They were dressed as with the regional dress. Uh, in the case of Spain, certainly there was at the beginning no unified historical narrative for Spanish history. Certainly some of its main paradigms were shared by the phalanges, the traditionalists, even by some conservative regionalists, and they all took up a theme first coined by Spanish 19th century historical writing, which identified a series of distinctive golden ages in Spanish history, the medieval reconquest, the modern empire, overseas expansion, etc. But from the at least, and we come back to continuities, right? From the 1880s, oh, on, local history was presented as complementary to this narrative. So, accordingly, the Iberian regions had been separate political entities in the past, but had been integrated into a single political community by virtue of the Catholic and dynastic loyalty. And here emerged a new dispute, how Castilian Spain and was and had been. Uh, Francoism actually also led to a revival of local and regional history, accompanied by flourishing new provincial-based research institutions. And these institutes of provincial history, of provincial studies, uh, were pretended to, or I mean, the original purpose was to justify the history of the provinces, but actually uh, they uh, ended up justifying the existence of the historical regions, then in popular culture, in the um, rural print culture, textbooks, etc., were always present, although the regions did not exist during Francoism as uh, political entities, and even many regional stereotypes continue. So uh, some of you may remember Jose Chuel Vasco, Joe de Basque, from the comics of the 1950s and 1960s, and many stereotypes which had been invented by uh, ethno-nationalist writers and historians uh, had a new history, had a new age under Francoism. Certainly there are other continuities regarding, for instance, the dealing with natural heritage. Here there are some parallels between Franco Spain and Nazi, uh, Nazi Germany. I mean, Nazi Germany, Heimat society is the idea of protecting uh, regional landscape was modernized in a way by the Nazis who also incorporated the idea of built environment, dams, drainage projects, motorways as uh, regional representations. And to some extent, the same happens in Italy and Spain. Uh, this idea, regional stereotypes were on the one hand pre-modern, but on the other hand, they became increasingly modern, the idea of built environment and a new 
regional landscape as being an, a kind of mixture of tradition and modernity. Um, and, well, uh, the idea of how to deal with distinctive cultures was another element. It's quite surprising to see, uh, very briefly, that, I mean, fascist Italy during the, in fascist Italy during the 1920s or in Nazi Germany, a certain promotion of dialects, of regional images, of, uh, of uh, regional dresses and folklore and search for folklore uh, was carried out. Uh, this ended in Italy during the 1930s, but it had some continuity in Nazi Germany, and this also included the promotion of dialects. Here, there was obviously a different way of dealing with strong languages or languages belonging to minorities with a king state. I mean, in the German case, the treatment of Danish or the treatment uh, of dialects were not equivalent to the way in which the Polish or, uh, or Lithuanian were repressed, and the same happened in Italy. While in Spain, there was always a kind of contradictory uh, attitude towards, I mean, there was no general law forbidding the use of languages. Languages, regional languages and dialects were good for the private sphere, of the semi-public sphere, but were not allowed in the public sphere, in particular administration and school. This is Heinrich Himmler and his visit to Madrid in 1940. You see he's surrounded by girls with regional dress. Uh, anyway, just to come to a conclusion, a very brief conclusion. Uh, fascist regimes, in my view, use regionalist or regionalized nationalist, state nationalist, as a form of identity politics through a wide variety of avenues. This was not devoid of ambivalence, but the strategy served many purposes, mobilizing popular support, promoting a particularly desirable vision of the state and the nation, marketing and commerce. There was a strategy of branding the nation through the region. That obviously the obvious question is, did regionalism really matter in the realm of high politics? Well, the Nazis did not invent regionalism. They mostly, sus they mostly sustain pre-existing practices. However, regionalism contributed to the success of the regime in two ways. First, competition between regions or among regions contributed to the cumulative ra radicalization associated with the workings of a polycratic government. Competition between the Gawe and even the lender drove economic development. Second, bonal regionalism gave the regime a harmless face that allowed many ordinary Germans to identify with it. I mean, sometimes fascist concepts of the nation were too abstract. This gave it some more concrete expression. And translating ambitions for racial purity and world domination into seemingly innocuous everyday practices helped form the bedrock of popular support for national socialism using concepts such as community, Volksgemeinschaft, authenticity. Obviously, there were limits to fascist mobilization of regionalism, first past interterritorial tension, moves towards separatism in the Weimar Republic, Sardinian regionalism in Italy to a certain extent, the consolidation of sub-state nationalism in Spain since 1898. These marked lines that could not be crossed. Uh, fascist nationalists feature a key imperialist penchant, penchant, so the region had to be put at the service of the empire. Second, in the hierarchy of the spheres of loyalty, from the individual to the nation, love of the heimat or the piccola patria, whatever, and attachment to the region always had to be subordinate to loyalty to the nation. However, attitudes towards this issue were far from uniform in the fascist ranks much depended on the perceived threat of ethno-cultural diversity to state stability. I mean, the Nazi regime could afford to be more regionalist. Italian fascism did not fear traditional regionalists in the core of Italy, but distrusted separatist tendencies in South Tyrol. In Spain, the strength of sub-state nationalists fooled the reluctance of sectors of the Francoist coalition to embrace regionalism as a cultural practice. 
And third, that's the real end, the real end, there were also unintended consequences. Fascist regimes failed to control all the meanings and political subtext embedded in the regional identities they tried to conjure up. So it cannot be denied that regionalism can be a vehicle for democratization. And in fact, regionalization in post-fascist Italy, Spain, and Germany did not represent a break with the past. There were some continuities with the fascist periods as well. And this demonstrates how regionalism also has a generous face, like nationalism, can be used for different agendas. Because in all three countries, uh, regionalism survived in some form under the dictators and resurfaced prominently in the restored democracies. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, let's get to the next uh, session or next section of this of this panel. I will. I do have a couple of remarks and just as an introduction to the to the discussion. Um, so, in my opinion, I think we heard three very interesting papers which actually fit very well together because they all um, uh, dealt with, let's say, one larger topic from different perspectives. Um, and so this larger topic, of course, one, yeah. Is, so is, um, it's basically about national movements um, in positions of minority or periphery or regionalisms, and this, of course, we can debate these, these terms, and always their different relationships to fascist movements, or to the centers and then the um, political centers and the fascist movements. So we heard a, a paper on the Flemish national movement uh, in Belgium, where it's already hard, or that was, I think, your argument, that it was even difficult to define if it was actually a nationality, minority, um, you, I think you mentioned uh, some, some other um, terms. And I guess one of the difficulties here is that this national movement, let's say, was technically the majority, but it was positioned as the minority. And I think that's a very specific um, case. And then, of course, uh, the question is, so if it's a minority, where does it belong to? Belong to? Does it belong to the Dutch nationalism? Um, does it belong to the, the German nationalism? And I think uh, the, one of the most interesting and important aspects here was that, at least for a time, this national movement mm. collaborated or connected to a fascist movement that was not their own movement, but from a neighboring country, namely uh, Nazi Germany. Okay, and then, and so I'm trying to point this out because I think these differences are, are quite interesting. And then we heard a paper on the Italian and German nationalist groups in, in South Tyrol, um, which each tried to win the same space for their own national cause. And I, what I find, found very interesting is this, uh, was this example um, of, at least in part, ignoring language as a national marker. Um, and then rather defining Germanized Italians or Italianized Germans, and then mixing up basically the, the classical um, um, national identities furthermore, in order obviously to strengthen their own national claims. And then, um, so that already happened early on, but then in the 30s, both of these national groups connected with their respective um, fascist movements. Um, so you have, of course, the Italian, um, it, the, yeah, the Italian nationalist movement in South Tyrol looking toward Rome, and then the, the German uh, nationalist movement looking toward Austria or, uh, or Germany. And then uh, in the, the third uh, paper uh, by Chaussee, so, mm -hmm. so it was interesting that you focused on, um, basically you turned this argument around because you did not look at the smaller, the national minorities or the, the regions per se, but you looked at the, basically at the um, nationalist or in this case fascist centers and how they dealt with um, 
the with with the regions or the or with regionalism with the regional identities basically hijacking them in order to convince even more people to join the nationalist or the fascist um, movements and you you had this phrase I thought it was it was very um, clear uh, this uh, this the regionalism gave fascism a harmless face I think that was a um, a great um, expression to sum up this, this um, the reason also why they decided that regionalism was actually important and they just did not just stick with, with nationalist terms or nationalist, um, like this, as, a, as nationalism as a, as a greater um, category. Um, so, and I'm, I think all of you used in your papers the word fluidity when you talked about your, your concepts. And I'm pretty sure we will talk in, this, in a larger debate about this, the fluidity of these various uh, terms. We talked about regionalism, about minorities, about nationalities, the differences, and, and actually this, the, the, in, in part the impossibility to define or differentiate one from the other. Um, nonetheless, I think in my, now in my first round of questions here, I think I would like to, to um, ask for another aspect. Um, because all of you were concentrating on um, discourses of these nationalist elites, nationalists from the center or from the regions uh, or minorities, um, uh, about propaganda, um, yeah, and mainly about the public uh, discourses. And so my question would be, um, in what way these nationalist, regionalist, and uh, minorities movements um, how popular were they in the regions? I'm not sure if that really fits your case, but I think the other, the other two, it could be a valuable question. So is it an, an elite phenomenon? Is it a popular phenomenon? Does this change um, in time? And then, um, and then also, I think we could, if we, talk, if we think about the, the periphery or the, the regionalisms in all cases, and now I'm thinking, uh, Jose, of course, you mentioned Germany, Spain, but then you mentioned also other, uh, Italy, and you mentioned other countries. So if we now, for a minute, think about these, the, the smaller nationalist movements, not the, um, they all existed before fascism. But then there was a time when they somehow got involved with fascism. Um, or with the fascist movements. And then, so this, for me, it, it beckons the question, um, this cooperation with, with fascism, was it a functional um, move, like a very pragmatic move to, to get the Belgium uh, or the Flemish uh, independence or uh, get um, settled once and for all the, the South Tyrol nationalist uh, or national question? Or was it actually an ideological um, alignment with now this new political um, force uh, in, in Europe? Um, and then we could also talk about what happens actually after, after fascism. How do these nationalist or regionalist movements actually deal with the with the end of fascism and how do they get out of the system without or out of this a uh, disaster of fascism without destroying their own political interests um, in, on the way. Okay, I, I do have more questions, but I think we should now open the floor, maybe make a first round, and then you can answer all, all of the questions you want to answer. So, the floor is open. Tim. Can you hear me now? Uh, right, okay. Um, I think you already covered some of what I uh, wanted to ask about. Now, I've got lots of questions, but trying to kind of bridge the three very, really very stimulating papers. Uh, is there a tension between what used to be called privacy of ideology, in the sense that I think the point um, uh, Jose made at the beginning about 
the Nazi rejection of the state as a concept is abstract French Enlightenment nonsense, as opposed to the organic nation. Uh, and then when you get to real boundaries, real states, real minorities, the, uh, the problems that are faced by pragmatist Italian or otherwise are actually very messy. So in Poland, and also in Alsace Lorraine, you have the Volkslister, where, you know, there's, it's open to interpretation who's Polish, who's German, you can apply to be German uh, without even speaking the language, to, to, to uh, mention the linguistic argument. But, I mean, were well, the Italians flexible in uh, Alto Adige, Zutirol as well, looking for archaeological evidence to find that Germans were Italian? Uh, Flanders, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it is like Austria, it has no nation. Now, but Flanders does, but Belgium doesn't. Uh, Belgium is a classic Nationalitätenstaat. Uh, and I've never been able to understand where any of the lobbies were going with it. The, you said the, the Netherlands ignored uh, the um, Flemish nationalists. The Germans didn't think they, they thought they were inept. Uh, even though they had the Flamen politic. So lots of questions about that. Are there continuities between the Flamen politic of the First World War and, and the Second World War? Uh, are there, uh, who, speak, who, are, who are these Flemish nationalists? Who do they speak for? Are they a tiny minority? I think that was the point that Sarah made. Uh, and, um, uh, and how do the Germans see them? Do they see them as autonomous? Or do they see, and if they see them as Germans, where does that leave the Walloons? Yeah, whether they become part of Germany or part of Holland. Uh, where, where do the, uh, what happens to the French speakers? Um, and in fact, are the Franks also Germans? Because the Franks are one of the Stemmer, uh, the Germanic uh, tribes, as indeed are the Visigoths. And, the, and the, uh, that means that the Spanish and the Italians are also Germans. I'll leave it at that. Yes, uh, thanks for, for your paper. Um, per Andrea, una domanda. Ha stato il fascismo più forte o più popolare a Trentino che diciamo in altre regioni che non era regione di frontiera? Perché um, c'è ricerca che, che mostra che i, i, i nazi, per esempio, è stato più forte in in regioni di, di frontiera e, e questo and then uh, for uh, Susan Manuel um, I mean, it's a tricky one but how did the idea of empire interplay um, with this um, regional slash national promotion of identity I mean I can see that working and particularly well in the case of the Carlist in the sense that Sort of regionalism that's linked to an empire, the Habsburg Empire, that was regional almost by definition. Therefore, that you, you can you know sort of draw a line there. But perhaps it's a bit more difficult uh, when it comes to the to the Spanish um, Falange or the Nazis for that for that matter. I think uh, so. Yeah. And just to to the, the last one and um, very brief. Um, for Emmanuel, does, does the, the, the Belgian Empire has any role in, in the Flemish? Or are just Republicans and, and you know, the Empire was Leopold's property and this is not our business? Okay, thanks a lot. Um, um, thanks for the question. Thanks for the feedback. I think it was great. Uh, I didn't see all of all these connections, so thanks. Um, so I'll try to go in order. There may, I might forget something in case. Just remind me during the coffee break. Um, so how popular were they? Uh, that it, it is not like the Flemish nationalists can be divided broadly speaking in two big parts, like the moderate Flemish nationalist movement that accepted Belgium and was looking for basically linguistic protection and they were also trying to turn the majority as into the, the, the most powerful group. 
They were trying to get beyond uh, French assimilation, the dominance of the Francophone establishment, and try to actually turn into a pro majority, even in political terms. But this uh, radical Flemish nationalism become, becomes ever more important in the 30s, and so it goes from representing like 2-3% of the uh, vote in overall Belgium, that means, according to some calculation, it's hard to do them because the data are not completely available all the time, but let's say around maybe 5-6% of Flemish vote, it goes to 8%, uh, 10 around, if, if you count to the seat, is it a little bit more, maybe around 15. Um, so that represents about a fifth of the Flemish population in some, in some calculation, or between a sixth and a fifth. So that's more or less the popular um, uh, support in, term, in, in electoral terms. And they are totally aware of this. So that's why until the invasion, the German invasion, the idea of creating a, a greater Netherlandic state is just an utopia. And they, they say it. They say we have to lay down the ground. Maybe in 20, 30 years we'll be able to create the ground in, on one side of the border and on the other, because they also know that in the Netherlands, it's, it's also there is no really real talk about this, apart from some uh, extreme fringes. But then, when there is the invasion, and they they think that the Nazi is going to support them because they've been in touch with them uh, through uh, for three, four, five years, they believe that they can do it because they have the Nazi on their side, and then they realize that the Nazis are not really on their side. So that's a little bit the, the thing, which answers also a little bit Tim's question. So there is a Flamen politic, because from 37 to more or less the, the, the first months of the invasion, the Germans collaborate with them because they want somehow uh, to exploit the VNV, this, or this party, uh, to somehow have uh, a kind of Trojan horse in Belgium. Like the, the VNV build up a, a military organization, but especially through propaganda through their own newspaper, they, they don't support so much Germany directly, that would be suspicious and they would risk a backlash from the Belgian state. But what they do is that they try to push for neutrality, and neutrality helps the Germans in reality in the perspective of a war. So that's the, the VNV discourse is about neutrality, is about not taking sides in the war. So in strategic terms, military terms, that helps somehow Nazi Germany. And then once the, the, Nazi, the, the invasion occurs, well then they believe that the Nazis would support them because they've been in touch with them, there is the secret diplomacy, there is also money that has been given to the, to the clerk and the party, but then in reality the, the German's plans are different. For the, the main thing they do is to keep ambiguity, about it. For a while they say many of the replies of the military administration is Hitler will choose the destiny of Flanders, we just have to trust him. Uh, and then they start promoting these pan-German pan organizations, SS Flanders, the Vlag, the Vlag and so on. And, and then at the end it, it gets to the, to the, to the, basically to, to the creation of a Flemish province within the broader right, so incorporation. But it's a process, and, and, and they believe, they, they do it, they believe for a, while, for a long time that they can take the German, bring the Germans on their side. So there is a kind of Flamen politique, but it's not the same Flamen politique as in the First World War. First, because it doesn't mean incorporation. The Flamen politique in the First World War led to kind of, some kind of autonomy, and then it's much more ambiguous also. Uh, then uh, there was a question about the... Um, the movement existed before, well, they were convinced, convinced fascists. Tolena Ere died at 200 kilometers away from St. Petersburg fighting with the, with the, with the, with the Abwehr, uh, with the Flemish Legion that was created precisely to ple in part to please the Germans, and in part because he was a convinced fascist. He, wanted, he, he, brought us, he brought us a lot of brochures against communism, and you know what the, the, one of the big stakes of that moment in history was creating the Greater Netherlands State and fight against communism. So he was a convinced, um, yeah, a convinced fascist, a convinced New Order uh, ideal. Um, by the way, I read that he was killed by the Division Azul uh, from uh, uh, not enemy fire, but from uh, the Division Azul fighting. Yeah, friendly fire. But I'm not sure. I wanted to ask you about that. Um, so that's to answer that. And then uh, the Belgian Empire. I haven't seen any mention of the Belgian Empire in their propaganda. Of course, they were basically. They, they, they basically supported racist ideas, uh, superiority of the um, Germanic people, in which Flemish were considered an, a different people from Germans, but Germanic in broader racial terms. But then uh, I haven't seen any real mention of the emperor. I'm pretty sure that if I dig deeper, I can find it, and I'm sure that they were totally supporting colonialism. 
but but I cannot really tell you uh, through like point to direct sources uh, concerning that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Sì, anch'io velocemente provo a rispondere alle tante cose e alla questione di quanto fossero popolari, diciamo così, questi nazionalisti è un po', eh, diciamo, una questione centrale anche, soprattutto, direi, nella storiografia più recente sull'impero asburgico, no? Cioè quanto questi movimenti nazionalisti fossero espressione di un'elite molto ristretta e quanto invece espressione di un qualche cosa che esisteva, che si muoveva dal basso. Un po' la domanda è, come dire, sono eh, le nazioni che già esistono, che producono il nazionalismo, o è il nazionalismo che inventa e crea la nazione? È un po' difficile, probabilmente è il contrario, cioè sono, i, eh, eh, sono questi nazionalisti estremamente attivi, estremamente capaci, che riescono a creare comunque un consenso, crescente e ciò che avviene negli anni 20 e negli anni 30 sembra dimostrare come questa invenzione diciamo così della nazione abbia funzionato e si è riuscita a risvegliare e a trovare un consenso se io penso al caso su tirolese noi sappiamo che alla fine degli anni 30 c'è questo accordo tra italia e germania e le cosiddette opzioni quindi la popolazione di lingua tedesca è, 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 è costretta a scegliere se rimanere in italia ovviamente rinunciando a qualsiasi identità nazionale linguistica o emigrare, per il, eh, emigrare in Germania, andare via, lasciare la propria terra eccetera eccetera e noi sappiamo che circa il 90% della popolazione sceglie di andare via e, e quindi evidentemente questa mobilitazione eh, che parte dal nazionalismo che cresce attraverso il nazionalsocialismo ha avuto successo e, e, e quindi io direi che diventa popolare, no? magari non lo è fin dall'inizio, ma lo diventa piuttosto in fretta. Su eh, questi nazionalisti, eh, ecco, mh, io dal mio punto di vista ritengo che questi nazionalisti, come dire, vedono nel fascismo lo strumento migliore, l'occasione, un'occasione straordinaria per poter vedere realizzate le, i propri propositi, i propri progetti. Ecco, quindi non lo so se io penso a una persona, a una personalità come Tolomei e, ecco, e, e noi andiamo anche semplicemente a ricercare i termini dei suoi ossessivi discorsi, dei suoi scritti continui, eccetera, è l'italianità che torna, non c'è mai il fascismo, no? Cioè il fascismo eh, è, è, è ciò che consente di imporre l'italianità. Quindi io direi che è più un matrimonio di interessi che una, eh, come dire, un coinvolgimento ideologico e a tutto tondo. E, e questa cosa poi porta all'ultima questione che, che dicevi tu, eh, Sara, cioè quello che succede dopo il fascismo. Beh, dopo il, fasci il fascismo c'è una continuità molto forte del discorso nazionalista, sia da parte italiana che da parte tedesca. E, e non è un caso che poi negli anni 60 del Novecento c'è un'emergenza terroristica in Alto Adige e, e, e non è un caso che, e qua mi ricollego alla domanda di Alex, che storicamente e, e ancora oggi la destra è molto forte sia a Bolzano che a Trieste. No? C'è una tradizione del movimento sociale italiano, quindi ben prima della nuova svolta a destra d'Italia, c'è una tradizione di destra molto radicata in queste zone di confine e, e, e per quanto riguarda il periodo fascista è soprattutto Trieste, cioè Trieste è un incubatore del fascismo che nasce e si sviluppa a livello locale e, ma che, che assume un ruolo anche a livello nazionale, perché, perché a Trieste c'è uno scontro nazionale che nasce nella fine dell'Ottocento molto più forte che in Trentino, perché la popolazione è mischiata, vive negli stessi paesi, occupa le stesse zone. In Trentino questa tensione è minore perché il Trentino è italiano, è un territorio italiano e a nord c'è l'Alto Adige tedesco. Quindi quando l'Italia acquisisce questo territorio, in Alto Adige gli italiani quasi non ci sono. Quindi uno scontro molto forte non è possibile. E cosa che invece avviene in, eh, a Trieste, dove il fascismo ha una tradizione appunto, e ha un rilievo anche eh, di carattere nazionale. E poi, vabbè, se vo volevo soltanto dire una cosa su, sulla eh, la, la relazione di eh, José, e, e, e cioè è che è interessante il fatto che persino in Alto Adige, qua, dove si vuole eh, come dire, reprimere la popolazione locale, 
però eh, si organizzano sfilate con i vestiti tipici su tirolesi, si, organizzano, si mantengono le feste tradizionali locali, no? la festa dell'uva con questa sfilata, con i carri tradizionali, con i vestiti tipici, le visite che i rurali, i contadini su tirolesi fanno al Duce a Roma e va, vanno lì con i vestiti tipici. Per cui persino in una, in, una, in una zona come quella dove il vestito tipico era legato a un'identità tedesca, e questo regionalismo viene utilizzato come un veicolo eh, di eh, come dire, avvicinamento alla popolazione locale. Io ci stavo pensando proprio al caso che dopo il 1958, quando i territori africani della Spagna diventano province, come nel Portogallo, territorio oltremare per così, diciamo, e Valeri, le, uh, risoluzio le risoluzioni delle Nazioni Unite, anche in Spagna c'è il vestito tipico dei Saharawi, del Sidifni, uh, e della Guinea che vengono, diciamo, paragonati a quelli di Girona, di Cadice, mm. di Madrid, eccetera, eccetera. Quindi è veramente che lì c'è qualcosa. Ok, I will continue in English because I mean. The, the, Uh, there has been so many questions, all of them are very interesting, so I'll try to, as far as I'm concerned, well, you say, uh, I think uh, Saga posed a very interesting question. I mean, uh, it, was it, it was a phenomenon of the fascist attraction, or attraction by fascism was felt by many nationalist elites, thinkers. It depends very much on the moment. At the beginning of the 1920s, uh, on, the uh, on the occasion of the March of Rome, it is quite striking to see Uh, people who came originally from the left but who are sympathized with Catalan or, or Galician nationalists who say, well, look, this Mussolini is a smart guy. He's doing something new. This is perhaps the end of the corrupt liberal state and so, and so forth. Oh, perhaps in Italy there is a solution. And particularly for some Catalanist intellectuals like Giuseppe, Giuseppe St. Fox and others, uh, there is a kind of fascination for this resurrection of the eternal Rome, uh, the, the visibility of nationalist tenets in Italian parades, etc., etc. Well, during the 1930s, fascination is different, and in that case, there is a strategic move, particularly by small radicalized groups who are looking for an external patron, mm -hmm. I mean, for an ally, and who don't care about the real ideology or the ideological, the, the ideological content of, uh, of uh, German Nazism. It is interesting that those movements who, which, or host elites are more stick to the past, particularly to Catholic worldviews, are almost immune to the influence of fascism. The Basques are immune to, uh, almost immune, because they see uh, that this idea of you know, putting the nation above God is not good. I mean, it's not exactly their thing. And perhaps because fascism is too modern, too contemporary. There are a couple of, I mean, it's in the Basque Nationalist new, newspaper, you see a couple of uh, articles dealing with corporativism, and ways, different ways to corporatism, so this idea of small uh, holding land property as something which is unique to the Basque sense of property, and which is anti-revolutionary, etc. And you see some references to Mussolini's discourse. But then they uh, immediately say, well, the problem is that first, this is not the Rome of the popes, it's something different. This is not the Christian Rome. Second, uh, fascism has the seeds of imperialism, and they tend to conquer other peoples. And perhaps in the future, they're going to be here as well, as it happened five years later, or four years later. So, uh, while well, some Catalans, even members of the Republican, uh, um, uh, Republican left uh, uh, of Catalonia, like Josep Tencas, were very sympathetic towards Italian fascism. And Italian fascists, on their turn, particularly if you look at the reports written by the Italian consul in Barcelona, he considered, well, if there is once a Spanish fascism, is going to be born in Barcelona and not in Madrid, because Barcelona is much more modern, it's open towards the Mediterranean, etc. And it's interesting, I mean, as you mentioned about Trieste, uh, that the first proto-fascist Spanish uh, groups in Spain, which emerged in the late 1920s, do not emerge 
actually in Madrid, but they emerged in Barcelona among radicalized members of uh, of a of a fan of a fan group of uh, Espanol of Barcelona is a football team, the Peña Iberica, etc. There are people who actually confront almost every day on the main street in Barcelona, the main avenue of the Ramblas. They are used to confront Catalanese uh, radical groups, etc. And they have disputes and they uh, experience uh, everyday disputes about flags and hymns, etc., etc. And then uh, the focus goes to Madrid, and then you have people like Eugenie Dors, the main philosopher who was one of the main ideologues of Catalan nationalism until the mid-1920s, who changed sides, goes to Madrid, and he's one of the inspirers, or inspires to a certain point, uh, the, idea, the phalanges idea of empire. So and in the phalanges idea of empire, as much as in the German idea of empire, uh, regional diversity had its place because empires, uh, by definition, are uh, diverse from below and united from above. So, I mean, the idea was, and this was originally a Prat de la Rivas, uh, I mean, the main ideologue of conservative Catalonies <laughs> at the beginning of the 20th century, and then Eugenie Dor's idea, if when Spain ceased to be a kind of confederation, ceased to be variegated, internally diverse, then the decadence of the empire began. First in America, well, actually, they look back to this independence of Portugal in 1640, etc., etc. So, uh, I mean, I like to look at um, ideological or at particular beliefs. I mean, like your, I don't know whether your former professor, Philip Bougan, no? uh, did you see how uh, in Spain this dialectics of position? Uh, but also, uh, let's say, uh, hybridization with peripheral nationalists plays a certain role in the beginning, in the first steps of uh, Spanish fascism. People who actually come from the left and then become Spanish nationalists because they, uh, they are afraid of what the Catalans or the Galician or the Basques want, and the other way around. Uh, and one of the, of the things mentioned by Tim, uh, actually, uh, I have the impression the Germans, particularly Germany, uh, within their indefinite purpose of creating a new European order, were very pragmatic, extremely pragmatic. What you say about uh, Ptolemy saying that, well, and it is people in this fascist saying or arguing that, uh, stating that, well, actually, the South Tyrolean people were Italians, Germanized Italians. I mean, Heinrich Himmler said the same about the Burgundians. They say that many people in France, or the French Comte, were Frenchified uh, Germans, and the Walloons were also Frenchified Germans or Germanic tribes, etc. So they could extend this category in a very, and they also did the same sometimes regarding to, to, to Czechs and the Ukrainians. So, uh, and this also refer to the fact that some very specific people even develop a particular uh, love or a particular affinity with Celtic peoples, for instance, the, 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 the so-called Celtologum within the Third Reich, where a small minority of the scholars who enjoy a certain audience, and even certain fascination with the Basques. And the best case was the first, one of the first governors of France, I mean, Werner West, who ended up being the German governor of Denmark. I mean, he favored some approach towards the Basques, saying, well, these are very old people, nobody knows where they come from, perhaps these are the original uh, Europeans. But I think it very much depended on strategic interests and particularly who were the mediators. Because as you know, the uh, Third Reich was a polyarchy, a, poly a polycentric structure where uh, some peoples develop uh, very different plans for the future of Europe and also for the future of occupied Europe. Ro Hans Rosenberg, uh, Alfred Rosenberg, sorry, is a perfect example. I mean, he had a very different view of the German policy of occupation in the East, but nobody took him seriously, but Andrei Vlasov and his divisions. I don't know about uh, this uh, Flemish guy being killed by a Spanish bullet, but I know is that Spaniards, there is a myth among the uh, Blue Division war veterans that the Flemish 
were the best fighters and the best soldiers. Uh, obviously, the, the second point was because, obviously, I mean, they defeated us in Flanders in the 16th century, so they must be good. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think we could probably do another round, but, uh, but I also see your faces that uh, many of you need coffee and fresh air and water. So I, I'm sorry to say that we cannot take any more questions now, but we do have the coffee break and you're all invited to ask your questions there. Thank you so much for being here and participating. Thank you. Great.